Um, so first of all, I want to thank you very much for setting time out of your day to talk to me. Um, you are number one on our charts right now at CFMU. So a, like a lot of the students are really interested in your music and especially your new album, Tao. So I'm really happy that you could join us. And um, so thank I just you. want to give a background. I guess I'm giving a background on you, although you know yourself fairly well. Um, but Chad is a Canadian rapper and broadcaster who has released six studio albums in his 15-year career. He's a Juno Award winner for Rap Recording of the Year. And CBC has titled you um, one of the greatest Canadian rappers of all time, which is crazy. Um, you're the host of Hip Hop Evolution uh, on HBO Canada and Netflix. And uh, you mentioned um, on that show that you even studied a little bit of hip hop in university, which is cool. Okay. <laughs> um, very, very interesting. I'd love to hear about that. And um, yeah, I just wanted to start off by asking you um, where you grew up and how the influences in your early life led you in the direction of becoming an MC, a producer and an artist. Sure. So I, um, my family's originally from Rwanda. Uh, I was born in East Africa and, and grew up in London, Ontario. Um, so not not too far from your campus there, probably an hour and a half, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and just grew up as a fan of music, a fan of all music, um, listened to the radio a lot, watched a lot of much music. And and in my time, you know, hip hop as it is now was was huge, you know. But when I was growing up, it was really exploding. It was really youth culture, you know. Um, so I got into freestyling with friends and um, one thing led to another, I guess you could say, um, although I'll try to think of a better way of putting it, a more descriptive way of putting it. Um, really, what what happened was uh, the opportunities to record became more accessible. So, you know, when I was 14, 15, it wasn't like it is now with laptops and everything where, where people had access to recording software and beats and all this stuff. Um, and so music was just something I did for fun. But a as as I got older, as we got into like the early 2000s, um, what happened was independent music started to to grow because the the means to record um, became a little bit more accessible. So, um, yeah, so I, I got to kind of have fun with with music um, more and more live music and then eventually recording and uh, i'm talking entirely too long uh for your first question but okay. but that's that's how i that's how i started just having fun with music and then eventually getting the chance to record i guess to sum it up awesome yeah that's perfect that's a great <laughs> answer. so i want to start off talking about hip-hop evolution um where was your inspiration for um joining this series and narrating this series? And how did you gain so much education on the origins of hip hop? Yeah, so <clears throat> hip hop evolution for me, it started with the two uh, guys at the helm, Darby and Rodrigo. They invited me in for a meeting and asked if I'd be interested in hosting. And um, going into that meeting, I didn't think I would do whatever it was they were proposing. Like I had never <laughs> worked in film or whatever, but I was just, uh, an admirer of both of those guys. I respected both of those guys from some of their previous work. So I was, you know, happy to meet with them and see what was going on. But as they were talking, I realized this needs to happen now. Like this documentation of hip hop's origins in this film form, documentary film form, it doesn't exist and it should exist and it needs to exist. And uh, I, I, I just got this sense of the urgency around it because um, our heroes, sadly, in hip hop and even in music more generally, they don't live forever. And so it, it just struck me in that moment, like we have all these great books about the history of hip hop, but we we don't have the definitive kind of not definitive, but, you know, some kind of documentary film that people can just go to and learn about the origins of hip hop. We, we just don't have it. And and we need to get it down soon. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, I said yes, and um, and the plan was just to make the first season, which is really just about the origins of hip hop, and and we were happy to do that. And then we got the opportunity to make more um, from Netflix, which was really exciting and fun to do. Um, as far as the learning, we had a great team of research researchers and producers, and so I always had all these big packets of research about all the different places and all the different artists, and so 
I got familiar that way. And then of course I'm like a fan. So there's a lot of that I, that I just knew too. Um, but it was an education for me for real. Like there were so many pl- little nooks and crannies, especially as the show went on, there were so many little nooks and crannies of hip hop history, local cultures that I didn't know. Um, and not just know the information, but had never been to those places. And that, and you get a totally different feel. Anyone who's traveled knows you get a totally different feel once you actually go there. You know, if you go to Miami, you understand this is a different place. You go to New Orleans, you understand this is a different place. This is, um, and, and so you get a feel for the culture that way. And, and, and really an education just from being there. Yeah. Um, in flesh so um so that was really a pleasure for me you know really being a part of the show in general was was a pleasure that kind of education that's fun that hopefully you know some of your listeners on campus are experiencing but you know <laughs> yeah education at like the core like at the location just must like enhance the experience so much i watched the first episode where um somehow uh you guys tracked down cool Herc and were able to go to like the exact street and like apartment building in the Bronx where like, I think it was um, said that hip hop began there. And I was just thinking like, how did you track down this individual? (laughs) Well, yeah, that's (laughs) a great, that's a great question because to be honest, the first season largely hinged on being able to get him, you know, he's the accepted cool Herc is the accepted godfather of hip hop. And so a documentary about the history of hip hop that doesn't have cool Herc is maybe not worth watching, you know? So we were able to get cool Herc because one of the executive producers of our series is Russell Peters, a comedian. Oh, and, cool. and what, what some people don't know, what many people don't know about Russell Peters is that he's a crazy hip hop head. Okay. Grew up break dancing, DJing and obsessed with hip hop. And, you know, since he became, the most successful stand-up ever in Canada. His whole life consists of just hanging out with his heroes in hip hop, you know, largely. Like if you see Russell anywhere, you know, he's with his family and he's with maybe other comics and he's with hip hop legends. And so Cool Herc is in his Rolodex. You know, Cool Herc is he sees buddies with with Herc and Herc likes him and trusts him. And that's how we got Herc. Uh, largely was through Russell. So um, big up Russell Peters. And yeah, and that moment was and still is surreal for me to be with Cool Herc at the accepted birthplace of hip hop. Um, You know, speaking of local, you know, educations, like education that comes from a felt lived experience of being somewhere. You know, that was a surreal experience and a learning experience. Um, all around amazing for sure yeah the traveling as well like just for the show must have been really fun (laughs) i imagine (laughs) getting to like see all these new places yeah i've always been a fan of seeing any new place you know i don't need to go to the furthest corner of the world to feel a sense of adventure you know sometimes i'll be in a small town in ontario that i've never been and it's and it's really exciting for me you know because this is a different place with a different history and a little bit of a different culture and so this show was really like that you know spending a week in detroit i grew up two hours from detroit but i never spent like a week straight or two weeks straight there and hanging out with people every night and like you know so i loved that that was that will be a lasting memory for me is just the, the travel and places i'd never been before either like um, Memphis or Oakland, um, you know, I, I, I love that aspect of it for sure. That's very cool. Um, and then now I wanted to ask you just quickly about your, your EP that came out in 2012 titled Melancholy and the Infinite Shadness. Yes. Uh, which great title. Like I was like having a fit over the <laughs> EP name. Um, so you used a lot of different samples, uh, the Breeders, Lenny Kravitz, Millie Vanilli, who I had to um, look up because I hadn't heard of them, but a very yeah. interesting group and also like Scandal. Like yes. they were like voiced. It wasn't really their voice. It was like someone else and they were lip syncing. That was an interesting rabbit hole to fall down. Awesome. Um, how did you select these samples um, to like mix with? Yeah, that was a really fun EP. We, I, I, I made that in a week with my DJ and, and another producer. And um, 
I picked all the samples. All the samples are kind of from a similar little pocket of time that's mm-hmm. near and dear to my heart, you know, like kind of childhood for me. Okay. And, um, and this sort of time, uh, time in my childhood as a music fan where I just like love this music, but I, I, I didn't know everything about it. You know, again, this is pre-internet. You couldn't learn everything about all these artists or whatever. They're just these little, you know, I think everybody has these little songs from their childhood that they love, you know? Yeah. And, um, and there's this tinge of nostalgia to all of them. And so um, for some reason, I just got inspired to kind of mine that, that little pocket of music for samples you know and uh, and it was fun to kind of go in different directions you know in hip-hop you usually sample soul jazz funk that's r&b it's usually where you're going um so i thought it would be fun first of all to mine a little period of time that's not often sampled but also genres you know like the breeders yeah alternative rock you know, al- alternative rock but i always heard the beginning of that song and thought like this is kind of hard like there's something kind of hip-hop about this and uh lenny kravitz and even millie vanilli yeah like millie vanilli was a dance pop group okay but uh that that song in particular i mean i can go into all the musical rabbit holes but that song in particular basically was a reworking of a baltimore club song you know so it it also has this sort of edge to it that you can hear in the music um and and actually that's really the foundations of hip-hop you know cool herc those djs that started hip-hop what they were doing was playing everything anything that was funky anything that made people dance whether it was rock or for, and that was that was actually one of the biggest inventions and offerings of hip-hop was that it was genreless it was one of the first kind of genreless approaches to music uh, and approaches to DJing. So, you know, that EP is definitely in that spirit. Um, yeah, I thought I had never like um, heard an album like that before that same, like just sampled like a very versatile um, number of genres. And yeah, when I heard the breeders, I was like, whoa, <laughs> um, very cool. And I, I love Kravitz. Um, and yeah, it was really just a fun, like a really fun album to listen to, EP to listen to. Awesome, um, thank you. Yeah. Tau um, is your latest release. It came out October 2021 and it's fantastic and complicated and it touches on so many different um, like multifaceted issues and um, topics of like work disparities and accepting like the an extraordinary in everyday life, capitalism, consumerism, systemic racism, <laughs> losing touch with reality. Um, and I've also just loved the amount of references that you can make in a song. Like you will go from like referencing Tolstoy to like Tegan and Sarah, peer reviewed science and like TV series. It's great. Um, awesome. Could you maybe talk about the foundations of Tao and um, like the meaning behind the album? Yeah. So what I always say is that the album is about connection, you know, and it's about losing touch with just about everything. You know, I, in my mind, I could see these different aspects of being a human being that we're losing touch with, whether that's nature or each other or reality or a sense of the sacred and the transcendent, um, all these different work and meaningful work um connection to the past to history you know we become increasingly sort of like ahistorical and don't have a great grip on where we come from and where we're going you know so all these different things that we should be as human beings connected to in order to feel healthy and whole um and it seems like we're losing touch with every single one so when i set out to make the album i was like well I felt like this gives me a lot of different stuff to talk about. Like you said, it's a wide ranging album. And, uh, and so it gives me a lot of room to write songs, but, but also something that kind of holds them all together. So, um, and, uh, and yeah, and I called the album Tao because there's a couple of books that influenced, um, influenced how I was thinking around all of this stuff. And one of them is called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. 
And it's an amazing book that I would recommend everybody read. It's very thick and it's, and it's dense, but it's thick because the writer spends a lot of time reiterating things because it's, it's important stuff. And basically what that book is, is, is a history of the last 20 years as it relates to technology, you know, from the beginning of, of Google, like 1998, and then the beginning of Facebook up to the present so that we can really understand our world now because mm -hmm. it's so shaped by these two companies and by technology in general, um, the big tech companies in general. So that book was a major influence, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, and another one called um, The Abolition of Man that was written about 40 years ago, or sorry, not 40 years ago, in the 1940s, so like 80 years ago. Um, and both of them have the TAO acronym, <clears throat> The Age of the abolition of, um, and so I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then, and then ta the Tao, uh, that's also written T-A-O, um, is, is, uh, is in the, in the book, The Abolition of Man. And, uh, and it also kind of relates to everything I was writing about. So, you know, overall, I was just thinking, you know, what, what, how can I sum this, <laughs> this, all this album up in like a word or like a phrase? It, it, and and I thought Tao that works. It's, it works as an acronym, and then obviously the spiritual connotation of the Tao as well. You know, all, all works. Um, but yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I'm getting into with these songs. Was it was the album organized sort of to be like in a stepwise story? Because I know it was like Tao one, and then like Tao part one, and then Tao part two, and then at the end it concluded with Tao part three. Mm -hmm. as um, was it or like organized chronologically like that, or was did it just happen to turn like? Yeah, it just kind of happened to evolve. So the way I try to organize it in my brain, I was thinking, well, each of these songs can be about you know one or two of these different things we're losing touch with, right? So there's a song called "Work," and it's about our relationship to work and losing touch with that. There's a song called "God" about our relationship to the sacred and the transcendent and our humanity and it's it's about that so that was really how i organized it and then yeah i put tau one two and three as songs on the album and they get longer and longer the first one's short the second one is two verses the last one just is me rambling and um the each of those uh so each, each of those songs kind of touches on technology a little bit more explicitly and directly um, and then the last one kind of is just a conclusion, sort of sums up everything I've been talking about in the album. So, yeah. Um, and the other thing with those three songs is they're all musically very classic hip hop boom bap -y. Um, And so I like putting those at different points in the album to kind of like anchor it too, because musically the album goes in a lot of different directions too, like production wise, sonically, there's stuff that's like, soulful and bouncy there's stuff that's like industrial and kind of punky um so i liked having also these moments where it just comes back to some straight up yeah no i love i love um yeah the straight up hip-hop i love slot machines which kind of like had a little bit like of a hardcore like start to it and black averageness is mm -hmm. like i think probably my favorite um uh i wanted to ask so do you think that Tao part three um, was your, like, did you mean to have it end on sort of like a hopeful note? Because I know that at the end, you're kind of like, let's resemble the peace, re-enter in touch. Um, was that meaning like, we are so disconnected right now, but like, there's hope that we can kind of like come back together as like- That's, that's exactly right. Um, I wanted to- I needed to try to end it there, you know, for myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if I, I would call it superstitious, but I just, I do believe in the power of words, you know, and, and what we put out there into the world. And so if I can't find some hope to share, like I need to find some hope for myself and then, and then I want to put out something hopeful into the world, you know, without sidestepping the realities, but mm -hmm. ultimately, um, you know, music is a hopeful thing and I'm trying to, and I'm trying to find, um, some hope. And, and I think that is really what I believe in the end, you know, I really do believe that we can do this. 
Um, and so, yeah, I, absolutely. You're right. That That's where I wanted to end it. I wanted to give some, some sense of uplift, some, some sense of my very real yeah. hope. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's great. Cause I, I, the whole album is almost like a learning experience then for the listeners at the end to kind of like have that settled in place. Like none of this has to be permanent um, is really important to hear. So yeah, yeah. Um, that was really uh, a great way I thought to like conclude the album. Thank you. Um, I have a question about God, which is uh, one of the songs you mentioned. Um, it sounds like someone's kind of recording a message in the, at the beginning and kind of at the end. I wanted to ask what the origin of this sample was. Yes, yeah, so that's um, that's my mom. Oh, cool! That's awesome. <laughs> and then my dad talks a little bit actually in between. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. So that's my parents. So I asked them. They live in Rwanda. They retired and they moved back. Awesome. And I asked them to record their thoughts on what it means to be a human being. Wow. And, uh, and, and I thought that this is a perfect thing to put on this song because um, a lot of times when we think about spirituality and especially when we think about religion, we think about almost turning away from humanity and looking up at the skies or something, you know? And what I wanted to talk about is a spirituality that makes us look at each other and our humanity and connect to that. And so um, that was really special to be able to get their thoughts, you know, um, because I mean, first of all, it's just nice hearing other people's voices on, on, on a recording, um, makes an album feel less claustrophobic and less kind of like my, just my internal world. It opens it up and helps it breathe a little bit, but also because frankly, my best ideas come from them anyway. So <laughs> might as well just like get it straight from them instead of translated through me sometimes. Uh, and so it was really special for me to be able to, um, you know, gather their thoughts on there. Yeah. Um, that's, a difficult question to answer. I would say if someone asked me what I thought the meaning of human like existence was, I don't yeah. know. I don't think I would have a, a, as good an answer as they did for sure. Cool. Um, can you expand on the importance of black averageness um, for the listeners and what you're trying to convey through it? Yeah. So that was a concept that came to mind, uh, you know, just thinking about Black excellence, which is something that we hear often and uh, is obviously, you know, wonderful and, and something to celebrate. Um, but the thought popped into my mind, uh, Black averageness, and kind of like made me laugh, you know, at, in, in contrast to that. But there's, there's something to that. Um, there's a lot to that idea uh, that, that I tried to put into the song. I mean, one it's just a fun song and it's, and it's funny and it's it hopefully, you know, just fun to listen to. But um, what I kind of wanted to get at is some of the pressures that really we all feel in capitalism in general, um, but certainly black people in particular um, feel uh, around like exceptional achievement just in order to survive, exceptional achievement in order just to be seen. Um, when really what I think freedom really is and equality really is, is the ability to just be yourself. And for most of us, by definition of the word, we're average. <laughs> by yeah. definition, you know, our society in general has a real problem with that. And, um, and so I, I kind of, I wanted to confront that. I yeah. wanted to like investigate that a little bit, you know, why, you know, I say in the song, I'm a man, why I want to be a goat. Like, what is that? Why is that? Um, why do we hate the idea of being, of being average? Yeah. Why? I was reading a book actually, like, um, I think it was called, um, like, how to not give a fuck or something it was like just this like self-help book that i got recommended and a whole like three chapters is dedicated to like not being 
not being able to accept like um just being in the average like everyone needs to feel like exceptional at something like striving to be exceptional and if they if you can't accept if you can't reach being exceptional it's sometimes better to be worse than like like even the, on the opposite end of just like pure struggle and pure like despair which yeah. i thought was an interesting concept but yeah totally totally I, you know it, it really is a society-wide problem and and if you think about um I think about the consequences of that. And part of the consequences of that is that like, we don't see ourselves in each other. You know, we have less compassion for ourselves and our own averageness, but then we also have less compassion for other people because if we don't see ourselves by and large as the same as other people, then you're going to have less compassion for other people. You're going to, you, you know, so, you know, there's some far reaching like consequences uh, to that. And, uh, you, you know, and, and one of the major consequences too, that I think is really important is we become so self-obsessed. Yeah. Right. Because we really feel like we need to stand out. We need to be exceptional in order to have any value. And then, so obviously that becomes an obsession and we're not thinking about other people and we're not thinking about bigger things. And really it's that that gives our life meaning and purpose and happiness and contentment is when we can stop thinking about ourselves for like a second. Yeah. So uh, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. And so, you know, it's a funny song, uh, and it's a fun song, but at, at the bottom, that's kind of what I'm trying to get to a little bit is, uh, is some of those, those consequences of living in this, um, hyper competitive, hyper individualistic, self-focused kind of society. Um, and, uh, I think that that's true for black people, but I think it's true for everybody. Thank you. No that's a fantastic answer. Um, so how do you think over the course of your career you've like grown and changed as an artist and MC? Yeah. Um, Good question. <laughs> no, I, I, I like that question. Uh, so one thing that's happened uh, is that I haven't changed in, in, in some ways that, and that's really surprised me. So uh, what I mean by that is, every single album I've made, I've sort of, I set out to do something different. You know, even I just described the concept for this album and that's different from the one before. But when I get to the end of each of these albums, I always realize that I'm saying the same thing <laughs> over and over again. I'm saying the same thing. And, uh, and that's just who I am as a person. It's like, I'm a person that needs to hear this message of keep going, keep trying. Um, and so that's one thing that I've, that hasn't changed, um, but that I've learned about myself as a person and as an artist. Um, but in many other ways, yeah, I've absolutely like grown and changed. I've, I've done all sorts of different things, getting to host hip hop evolution, getting to host Q on CBC radio. Like these were things I had zero experience with and just sort of like hopped in and, um, you know, in an effort to, well, have fun and enjoy the experience, but also to grow and to be challenged. Um, and so I, I recorded a, like a retro pop rock album um, under a different alias, like oh. all sorts of things just to like grow and change, you know? Um, yeah. I, I think also just developing too as a musician, I've been able to do things uh, musically that I, I couldn't do when I started. You know, my early, my earliest couple of albums are very straight up boom bap hip hop and I, I love that music and I come from that but I'm also just a, a fan of so many different sounds and styles but it just took time to be able to incorporate some of those things um, some of those influences into my music in a way that makes sense so I, I've loved all of that I've loved all the opportunities to grow and be challenged you know like yeah I, I wish that for everybody and whatever they do in their work yeah, you have done so many versatile um, things in your career that like um, those off, like I believe, I mean, I'm not a young artist, unfortunately, but I imagine that it's ins inspiring for a lot of like 
young artists trying to like make it today. Um, I imagine it's quite overwhelming. One, one step at a time, you know, I, and like, I, I just, I really do hope that for, for everybody, you know, got it to, to, and, and it kind of relates to this thing of averageness too, because when I think about black averageness, I think about the prerogative to the opportunity to try and fail, you know, and then try again and succeed, yeah. you know, like, I really believe in that. I believe in trying things. Not everything I've done has worked, but um, I'm so much better for having explored. Yeah, failing is learning. That's my yeah. my motto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so one final question. Your tour is coming up very soon. Um, how are you feeling for your tour? Um, and I know you're coming to Hamilton, so I'll be there. And I'm sure a lot of other students will be. But yeah, are you excited for it? I'm super excited. I'm nervous because I haven't gone on tour in a while. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm excited, you know, playing live is the fun. It's the, it's the most fun part of what we do. You know, I think a lot of musicians have been struggling through COVID, not just for financial reasons, but also because the fun has been missing. Yeah. And so uh, I, I really look forward to that. Um, Hamilton's always a good time. So I look forward to being in Hamilton in particular. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah, you too. So. Um, well, thank you so much for taking your time um, out of your day to speak to me. Uh, all of, well, everyone at CFMU is super excited and um, happy about that. And so. yeah, best of luck on um, your tour and have a good week. <laughs> uh, thanks, Olivia. <laughs>